Just today, Mikhail Gorbachev, the final communist leader of the Soviet Union, passed away at the age of 91. And interestingly, in the year 1991, there was a last ditch effort to try to save the Soviet Union. So why didn't it work? Today, History Matters is going to show you and I'm gonna add my commentary along the way. The original video link is down in the description. Make sure you give it a view, like, subscribe as History Matters does awesome little tiny short form documentaries. All right, let's get going, comrade. As 1991 was reaching its end, the Soviet Union, the world's second superpower, was in the process of catastrophic political collapse. This outcome had been fairly apparent for over a year now, and the Soviet yep. president, Mikhail Gorbachev, had tried numerous policies to preserve the USSR. Glasnost, perestroika. Look them up. I'm sure they'll get to it, though. These included widespread reforms, notably Glasnost, which opened up the press, allowing for criticism of the government, and Perestroika, which reformed the internal operations of the USSR, notably by instigating economic reforms which allowed private enterprise and foreign investment. Now, if you're like, that sounds very non-communist, well, Mikhail Gorbachev was one that said, to save the essence of communism, you had to apply some flexibility, right? Didn't necessarily, you know, he, he believed that you didn't have to be under the censorship police state, right, to embrace the, the, the spirit of communism. So you get that. But then also you get this economic reform saying there's got to be some reforms. Uh, it's been too hard for the government to maintain the entire economy itself. So it's going to need some reforms to allow some investors and things like that. And that heavily split a lot of people in the Soviet Union, um, whether they liked or didn't like the direction that it was going. And to be honest, Gorbachev couldn't make anybody happy. To communists, he was going too far. And to people that were trying to get away from that, he wasn't going far enough. He did not have a lot of friends. Something which upset many hardline communists. Whilst the collapse of communism there was by late 1990 seen as mostly inevitable, the collapse of the state itself wasn't so certain. True. In early 1991... What they're trying to say is all those satellite states and stuff of the Soviet Union. Remember, the Soviet Union is not just Russia. It was um, uh, multiple uh, republics. And they were breaking off in the years leading up to this, but they didn't necessarily think like, like in Russia that there'd be a whole regime change. That wasn't necessarily a given what was starting to happen here in 1991. Part of Gorbachev's democratic reforms, there was a referendum on whether or not the USSR should be preserved, which was approved by over three quarters of the people from these areas. The other areas had, to use a technical historical term, noped out and didn't take part. Now remember, these places is the other right areas. here are places that the Soviet Union invaded in World War II and saw, and many people, um, again, very divided within those communities, uh, saw the Russians as foreign uh, oppressors. So be more likely for them to break apart and want a regime change than maybe actually back in their homeland. Has had to use a technical historical term, noped out and didn't take part. Now, when I say that people voted to preserve the USSR, I don't mean the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, but a new state, the Union of Soviet Sovereign Republics, which, as the name suggests, didn't have to be communist. Furthermore, a new post was created within the USSR, the president of the debated. Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, and in July, Boris Yeltsin was elected to that post, <laughs> something which upset many hardline communists. Right. And so, some high-ranking like members him. of they the Communist like Party, including Vice President Gennady Yanayev and head of the KGB Vladimir Kriuchkov, decided to intervene. In August of 1991, while Gorbachev was on holiday in Crimea, the plotters leapt into action and placed him under house arrest. Oh, Gorbachev was on holiday. A random. He was asked to resign, but he promptly told them no, and so they told the country he was seriously ill and unable to lead. <laughs> and in response to this, the plotters created the State Committee on the Emergency Situation, led by Yanayev as acting president, which would run the country in the meantime. The Soviet coup had formally begun. The coup began with tanks rolling into Moscow and politicians who were seen as a threat being quickly arrested. With one notable exception, Boris Yeltsin. <laughs> the committee quickly shut down all critical newspapers and broadcasted what they were going to do. They were going to fix the economy, restore the Communist Party to its rightful place, take back control of the parts of the country that wanted to break away, and finally win the Cold War. Yeah! <laughs> Um, are the communists living in a deluse, totally a state of delusion here in 1991 that they think all of this can happen? Sounds lovely, yet despite this rhetoric, the people running the country didn't have any plans on how to do this except for stop the reforms. 
You're you're decades late, commies. You're decades late on this. This new leadership was incredibly worrying to the wider Soviet citizenry, and was especially so to the press and anyone who has criticized communism recently, there we since go. there was an expectation that the new leaders would begin a purge once they'd cemented their position. An expectation that wasn't entirely without merit since most of the KGB were on board. Also, the coup had some support from the That is a very powerful ally to have, the KGB. Yeah. You want them on your side. Military. Sure do any type of coup. Including the defense minister, Dmitry Azov. They're hardcore. Hence the tanks on the streets. Not all of the military was supportive, though. Notably, the higher-ups in the Air Force this were opposed feels wrong. and there was a severe rift across the armed forces. Military support for the coup didn't stop Soviet citizens from protesting against the change in leadership, and Yeltsin was a notable critic who became a central opponent who called for Gorbachev's restoration. He was also supported by a sizable part of the Soviet army who, together with some civilians, formed a barricade outside the White House. Not that one. In Lithuania, which had declared independence more the year before, one. Soviet troops were still stationed there and a committee planned for its reintegration into the USSR. Across the USSR, right. widespread protests and strikes broke out as many politicians, both communist and not, opposed the committee's actions. Furthermore, Western leaders condemned the coup and halted all cooperation with the of USSR. They, Within they the love the fact that the USSR was collapsing. They loved it, the, the West. The Soviet Union, the individual republics were split down these lines, and the committee <laughs> wasn't without some support internationally. Nah. Communist states like Cuba, North Korea, and China were supportive of the coup, since they felt that Yanayev and his colleagues were communist? right, and they had no interest whatsoever in losing the primary defender of global communism. Things started to heat up as demonstrations became more incensed and there were some isolated incidents of violence. This was also the point where some in the committee realized that they weren't going to be successful. Yeah. The day was also rounded out by Estonia unilaterally declaring independence, which probably wasn't what the coup leaders were hoping for. Well, obviously, they don't lose any states. They were talking earlier about how China and uh, Cuba, two of the other notable kind of communist states would definitely not have wanted to see the USSR collapse. I mean, historically, the uh, uh, Soviet Union had been supportive of them. China had kind of broken off and done their thing actually way before that. And even the Cubans to some extent, but that would have been uh, much later, but they had a much stronger tie. And they were they were the the granddaddies of, of communism or their backbone, their support structure in a world that was, you know, uh, getting away from from communist ideologies. It was breaking apart. It was the, the last remnants left of the Cold War. Overnight, there was some fighting between soldiers on the side of the committee and those who had sided with Yeltsin, with Yeltsin's troops withstanding the assault. It was at this point that the rest of the committee realized that they had failed, and some of them subsequently fled Moscow. Yanayev opted to face his fate in Moscow, you whereas the rest, barring one, because, well went to see Gorbachev mm -hmm. in Crimea in order to hopefully not get purged once he was back in charge. Of the members of the military which had sided might with well, the you committee might want us to then switched there. allegiance and pulled all military forces out of Moscow. The Supreme Soviet, the Soviet Parliament, then announced that the crisis was over and that Gorbachev was restored as president. The coup was over. The remaining committee... Don't worry. Less than a year away. Committee members were quickly rounded up and arrested and order was restored to the streets of Moscow. There were several reasons for the coup's failure. The first was Gorbachev's refusal to resign, which robbed Janayev of any legitimacy True. in the eyes of the public. Like we were saying earlier, uh, he did not have a lot of friends uh, at this time. He was uh, either not communist enough or too communist. So, yeah, he his support structure was Another was nah, that the military gone. wasn't entirely on board and politicians like Yeltsin kicked up a fuss. Yeah, can't the have biggest a divided reason military. that the coup failed was the people who took to the streets and stared down armed soldiers to prevent a return to the politics of old. Gorbachev's changes were popular and the coup's leaders assumed sure. that taking control of the party meant that they could stop it. Yet, where they Hardcore. miscalculated was that the party was no longer able to override the people and their support for the changes. The coup effectively doomed the Soviet Union and the Communist Party there and the Backfire. USSR itself would only last for another four months. <laughs> the leaders of the committee were imprisoned, and Yeltsin would go on to become Russia's first president. The last-ditch attempt to preserve the Soviet system was a failure, and the fact that it didn't spiral into a wider revolutionary conflict is honestly quite amazing. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and thank you for watching. With a special thanks to my patrons. All right, wrap it up. Well, we have a massive backfire on the hands. <laughs> they were trying to restore kind of the communist state that was fleeting and it actually ushered on even quicker the dissolution of the USSR completely. So this is an epic fail. All right, I thought this would be good to check out. Hopefully you enjoyed this. If you didn't know about the coup and are interested in the fall of the Soviet Union, which I know I am, 
uh, this should have been a good little kind of place to, to start and you can keep your research going. There's a lot of other great content out there that's going to go into even more detail. And hopefully this is a good uh, little spot for you to start. So with that, thanks again for watching. Original video link is down below. And you might check out some other links down there to some other stuff you might find interesting as well. All right, we'll see you next time. Bye.